Welcome back to our workshop. Today I'm working on this rustic chest. It was built in a way that you can see the exposed nails. It's not fine joinery, but it's a sentimental piece for the owner. They brought it to me because of a couple of reasons. One is there's a large gap in the top and they're using this as a coffee table so they'd like that closed up. And the hinges at the back of the lid have also come off. You can see here there's a fair amount of damage on the back of this. It looks like there's a little bit of wood rot, some pieces missing, so I'll need to repair that. There are also some drawers on the inside. This one's missing a pull and this one's come right off. This one here won't really slide properly, so I'll need to address that as well. There's a lot of damage to the wood in this chest, so my challenge is not only to repair that, but also make it as least visible as possible. Stick with me, I'll show you how it's done. As a furniture repair business, we're opening the doors to our workshop to show you the tools and techniques to repair furniture. The front rail here, you can see this has been broken off. We give you tips to make your repair projects easier. Let's get into the workshop and start fixing furniture. I'm not sure how to judge the age of this piece. I can tell by the surface here it's been hand planed with a jack plane. It wasn't smoothed down. So this wasn't meant to be a high end piece. It's got some wrought iron hardware here and on the end. And it's got square nails that are holding it together. Where do you start on a project like this? The first thing I do is inspect the damage. What I want to do is understand how the damage happened so I can repair it, but also prevent it from happening in the future, if that's possible. So if I open this up, we take a look at the hinges here where well, they've come off on this piece. So here what I notice is there's a piece that's been patched in here where the previous hinge was. Someone's moved it over here. I also see that there's a piece of looks like thin piece of wood going across here. This area is a real mess here. There's a hole down here under this hinge. It looks like where the screws were has just pulled apart. There's a screw here. So there's a lot of wood damage here. I'll have to look at and take this piece of wood off. On the left side here, you can see there's a great big hole down here. So I don't know what's hiding behind this board. And under here, we've got some more damage where the wood is split. On the underside of the lid, you can see there are three straps here, and these have been screwed on, which explains why there's such a gap here. That's because of wood movement. The customer wants to use this as a coffee table, so the primary goal is to close up the gap in the lid and put hinges on this so it operates properly. The first thing I'm going to do is take a look at what's going on the back here. I need a secure spot to anchor these hinges, so I'm going to deal with that first. I'm really curious to see what's hiding behind this piece of wood here. Now, I want to be as gentle as possible because I don't know if I'll need to put this piece back on here to conceal some of the damage. Well, my first discovery here is this piece has been refinished before. You see here's some old dirt and grime. It looks like there might have been some paint on this. And this was put over top. And you can see how consistent it is here. So that's a refinishing job. Now underneath here, I can see there's a line down here and a line down here. That tells me that there were likely some strap hinges here. So this would have been maybe the original strap hinge. Then there was an, another hinge put here. And the third location is here. This has really seen a lot of abuse over the years. If I hold this up here, you can see that it's been notched out so this drawer will operate properly. Because of all the damage under here, I think I'm going to hang on to this. Now on the other end of it, there's some pieces missing and I think they might be in there. So I'll see if I can patch this back together again. I'm gonna set that aside for now and turn this around. So we can take a look at what's going on with this wood here. It doesn't look as bad as I thought it would be at the back here. This is going to be visible. There's a loose piece of wood here. This looks solid along here. There's a bit of a splinter missing here. And over here, it looks like someone's potentially nailed this together. But you can see this looks like a six board box. And in early Canadian furniture, the boards would be this large because they were difficult to harvest and they didn't have a way of gluing things together. But if I look closely here, I can see that there's a seam right here. So this isn't old enough to be early Canadian furniture, um, but again, it is hand planed. So someone did use a lot of hand tools on this to get it smoothed out and looking this way. 
Now that I understand the damage that's happened to this piece, I need to do two things. The first one is to patch the wood so that I can secure the hinges to it. The second one is I need to secure the hinges in a different way than what's been done so far because obviously this hasn't worked. I've got some hardware solutions I'll be showing you as I go through this project, but first I need to separate all these loose pieces and glue them back into place. Part of the reason I share these videos is so that people don't do something as silly as this. This is a number 10 Robertson screw. It's a square drive screw and that's what we use in Canada. But someone's just taken this large screw, driven it in here, and just split the wood open. It's just an unnecessary way to try to repair something. It's never going to work. There's a little tiny finishing nail here holding on this sliver. There's a couple of finishing nails here and here. There's a nail in here. There's a lot holding this together. I think there's been a number of failed attempts at repairing this over the years. So just for fun, I'm going to hang on to these nails and see how many I can collect. On the bottom of this piece, you can see there's some residue here. It might look like wood rot, but no, this is wood filler. So someone's tried to pack some wood filler in this crevice to try and solve the problem. But here's another loose piece of wood. So I'll need to clear this out, get it cleaned up, and then glue it back together. On this side, the splinter's moving, and I can see one, two, three, four, five nails holding on this little piece of wood. <laughs> this is funny. This nail even has glue on it. Look at that. That's crazy. Here's more damage done by fasteners. There's a nail here, a nail here, and it's just split that block in half. So here's another example of a poor repair. You see right here, there's a little bit of glue residue. A little bit right there, it's just falling off. A little bit here, it's just falling off. This is a result of someone putting glue between two pieces of wood and not clamping it. This glue doesn't work, PVA doesn't work, unless you actually clamp it. So I'm gonna to have to clear that out so I can get a nice tight joint here, take the nails out, and that way I can get this glued together and this will be stronger than the rest of the wood itself once that PVA sets. You can see inside there, there's some dried PVA. So I'm going to have to try and split this apart so I can get that cleaned out and then close up that gap. So these pieces are starting to come together now with the glue out of them. And you can see there, it's not perfect, but it's much better than it was before. So what I need to do is glue all this up, clamp it up, and we'll have a nice strong bond to hold everything together again. Thank you. 
Be sure to go to our website and subscribe to our newsletter for links to new videos, workshop tips, and more. Now back to fixing furniture. I let the glue dry overnight on all these parts because PVA typically needs 24 hours to come to full strength. So I'm going to take the clamps off now and look at what I need to do to make a spot where I can secure the hinges. Okay, let's see. Yep, got a nice solid space. But you can see there's a mortise down here and this is recessed, lots of damage and a bit of hole down here. Let's see what this side looks like. I need to replace this damaged wood here. So what I'm going to do is cut a block and glue it in here. But you can't just cut a square block because end grain to end grain, these two pieces here, would have no strength at all. So in order to get strength, what I need to do is put a scarf join in. So I need to cut this on an angle. And then when the new block gets glued to the existing side here, there'll be strength on that end here and here. And that will make sure that that block is as strong as it possibly can be to stay in there. To patch in a piece of wood like this and disguise it, you need to make sure you're using the right species of wood. If I were to throw a piece of oak in here, for example, it would stand out when I put the finish on because the grain pattern is different. So I need to find a piece of pine that's going to match here. And luckily, I have some vintage pine that will help me in this situation. You can see I've got a lot of wood in here and some of it is vintage. Up here, I've got some pumpkin pine and some red pine. There's some type of wood you just can't purchase anymore. These are two boards I got from a retired furniture finisher. And they're old growth pine, which means the growth rings are very tight and the grain pattern's very tight. And that's something that I want to match here. But it's also interesting to see when you add moisture to them, how they react to the finish. And that's gonna help me disguise this repair. So I'll just add moisture to both of these pieces of wood and we'll see what the color looks like. So there you can see the color difference with the red pine and the pumpkin pine. And this is a piece of pine that I just purchased from the lumber yard. Get it wet, put it up here, and you can see it just holds no color compared to the vintage. And then when we take a look at the end grain as well, so here you can see the end grain is very tight. Here it's very open. So the space between the rings, there's a large space. Here, there's really tight spacing. I'm going to start the process by cutting the angles with my Dazuki saw. This allows me to get a really fine cut. Japanese saws cut on a pull stroke so the blades are thinner, and I really enjoy using these. I'll then use a rotor to clear out the base. To lay out where I want to cut, what I'm going to do is put some blue tape across here. And then what I can do is figure out exactly where I want to cut. So I'll just line it up with the top edge here and here. So the damage over here starts about there. When I look at the damage back here, I can see there's some loose wood down in this spot here. So I'll need to go at least that deep there. And on this side, this whole piece looks loose. So I need to come back a fair bit. I'll come back to here at the top. Oh, I've got the line there. So that makes sense. So I just have to figure out the depth from the top of the surface here down to here. If I put a ruler on the top here, that'll give me a line to reference from. I need to go down three quarters of an inch. So I'll mark three quarters of an inch down on the tape here. And then I'll draw my line across it. Here, I need this cut on a 45. And then the damage here, I'll take back to about this point here. Just need to lightly hold that on the tape. And then mark my angle. So if I take out a piece from here all the way over to here, I'm just concerned about what this might look like. That's a fair bit of wood I'm replacing. But there's not that much missing at the front here. 
So I think I'm going to change my approach. What I'm going to do is replace this piece back here behind the surface and leave the surface as is. And then I'll just patch these little tiny pieces after I've got this part patched in the back. On this other side, it's going to get a little bit more complicated because I've got this built-in tray here. I'm going to switch the tape around to the inside here because that's where I'm going to see everything. So I'll just line up my marks again. And then I can flip this over. And I'm going to use a rotor to clean out the space in here. Now I'm going to bring in my large bench hook here. And this will just help me stabilize this chest. There, nice and secure. I'm going to start by cutting the 45 degree angles first. I'll pull in my handsaw and just follow the lines. Now this tape is pretty flimsy for a guideline and I want to make sure I get a machined cut here. So I'm going to take my rotor and run it this way, but in order to get that straight line, I need to provide some spacing back here to run as a guide. So I've worked out the right number of boards here to get me to a three quarter inch depth. And then what I'll do is run my rotor tight against that, use it as my guideline and move that across here. I just need to set this to a three quarter inch depth and I'll be ready to go. Now I'll just use a really sharp chisel to trim up these pieces here and get the corners nice and tight and ready to fill it in with a patch. This area here my router couldn't get into so I'm going to have to clear this out with a chisel but it's a good thing because right here there's a piece of metal that's probably a broken screw and there's a another finishing nail right there. So I don't want my tools to be hitting those nails. Because I cut these at 45 degrees, cutting a patch is going to be simple for this. But you see, there's a little bit of a void in here, there's a little bit of a void here, and the only glue that will hold when there's voids is epoxy. So I'm going to epoxy these patches in.
With these blocks glued in here, I can now move the chest off the workbench and start working on the top. But before I do, I want to talk about wood movement and compare this to the rest of the chest. I'll set the lid here and you can see there's a large gap between these boards. But when you look at the joints here, these ones are all closed up. And why is that? Well, the wood grain is running this way here, the wood grain is running this way here, and wood expands and contracts across the grain. So as this board here expands, this one does as well. So it's all being kept together. This one here is expanding and contracting, but if I flip it over, someone's screwed down these straps here. So it's constraining the boards from moving, and therefore the gap has opened up. That's what I need to fix on this lid. Now to give you an idea of how moisture affects wood, this is a branch I cut off a sugar maple in my backyard. This is the crack that formed when it shrunk. Now this is a dramatic change because it was green wood to begin with. But these boards here, in the summertime when there's humidity in the air, they will expand. And in the wintertime when we heat our homes and the air is drier, they will shrink. So this is an eight inch board. I'm guessing it might expand or contract about an eighth of an inch over the season. This distance in here is a quarter of an inch and it's winter right now. So what I'm going to do is take these straps off and close up that gap, but I also need to deal with these bandings on the edge. So these are held on with nails, so they should pry off pretty easily. There, that's starting to go. So if you look at the nails here, it tells a little bit of the story. This is a square cut nail. This is a modern nail. This has been added recently. This is a square cut nail, a square cut nail, a square cut nail, a modern nail, and then another square cut nail. This one's moving back and forth, when that would allow some wood movement. This one, it's firm. This one, it's firm. Over here, look how loose that is. And this one, it's so loose. Look at the wear here. There's just a pocket. So these square cut nails, I think were allowing the wood to move, but someone did a repair where they put this in, they put the straps on. It probably caused the boards to separate. Now we can stand these boards up here and look at the joint. There's a lot of dirt between these and there's even a square nail here. I'm not sure why there would have been a nail underneath this piece. Let me just flip this over. This is where the nail is on the joint, but I see a cut off nail here and here. A little one up here, another one here. I'm not sure why there's this random sampling of nails in here. But you can see the joint here is fairly tight. I just need to clean that up and I can glue these two boards together. When you're gluing two boards together, you need to use a jointer. You can either use a power one or what I've got here is a number seven plane and this is known as a jointer plane. So I'll clamp these up in the vise, get them lined up and then plane the edges. The first thing I want to do is clean off this joint because this will dull my blade. So I'll just use a scraper to clean all this excess stuff off. And then I can make sure I've got the boards level to each other as close as possible. There was so much on these boards here, I'm wondering if I even need to joint them. So let me take this off. Stand this up and see what the joint looks like. From the end here you can see these boards aren't in a straight line and if I take my plane and hold it up here you can see this isn't flat. So what I need to do is get it flat like that. And the way we do that is take the two boards and sandwich them face to face together and run the joiner across and that way these will end up being a flat board when I pull them back this way.
So now what I'm going to do is put my plane on here and I've retracted the blade so I've got nothing coming out here. What I need to do is advance the blade just slowly. And you can see the shaving starting to come off. And as I keep going, you see the shavings are getting wider. What I'm looking for is a shaving across both of those boards at the same time. And then my joint is ready to be put together. By clamping this together, I can see I've got a nice tight joint here. I've got a gap all the way along here. And then over here, I've got it tight again. So what I need to do is just work on this little piece here and get it perfectly flat. I was being careful not to take too much off of the front, but I need to address that and then we should be good to go. With a clamp on here, we've got a nice good fit. So what I'm going to do is glue this up and I'm going to use a dark glue, so PVA glue. So this is going to be a permanent bond. I'm not using hide glue here. And I like using dark glue when I'm working with pieces that have finish on them because if there is any that is noticeable, such as in a knot like that, it's more disguised than traditional carpenter's glue, cabinet maker's glue, yellow glue, whatever you want to call it. So I'll just spread this on. There's a debate in the woodworking world of do you need to put glue on both sides of a joint like this? And I say Put it on both sides, that way there's no guesswork of whether you got everything covered or not. See, as I'm going through a br with a brush like this, I could end up missing a spot. But if I brush it on both sides, chances are that's never going to happen. Because I've got good glue coverage on both pieces. And then I'll clamp this up. And I'll show you how many clamps you need when you're clamping things up because that can be confusing as well. Now clamping pressure radiates out at 45 degrees so if I go 45 from here I can see I've got clamping pressure across this joint. Do I have enough? Maybe, maybe not. But the next clamp I can put on is here. I'll cover that off and over here cover that off. Take a look at the joint. If I don't have enough glue squeeze out I might want to add a little bit more pressure. While the glue is drying, I need to sharpen my smoothing plane. This is my great grandfather's hand plane, so it's got a lot of sentimental value. And I keep it fairly sharp, but every once in a while I need to tune it up. So I'll take this out and I'll show you my sharpening supplies. These are whetstones, so if I need to do some work where I'm taking out uh, some damage, this is a 1000, 4000. And I've also got a diamond stone, this is an 8000. So I'm just going to touch it up on this. And the wet stones need to be flattened, so this is a flattening stone. Um, they do become dished, so you need to make sure that they're flat before you use them. So because I'm just touching this up, there are no nicks or dings I need to take out of the blade. I'll show you how I do this. Now, if you've never seen someone sharpen with a honing guide, I highly recommend these. So there's my blade. And this is a honing guide made by Veritas. And a honing guide makes sure that you've got a consistent angle when you're working on a stone. So there's a guide here that is for setting it up. And what I do is slide that on and set the gauge here for the width of the blade. So I've got an inch and a half blade. And I've got the angle already set to 30 degrees for the blade. So now what I do is carefully slide the blade in. and line it up, lined up with this, then it's square, and to that point. And then it's just a matter of tightening this up, taking the guide off. And now what I have is this rolls on the stone, and this gives me the bevel I want.
Now on this guide, it's got a micro bevel setting. So a primary bevel, this would be up, but I've got it on the micro bevel setting. So right now I'm all set to start sharpening. I just need to put some water on here. I'm just gonna set this down here. This is a stone holder. You definitely want one of these because the stones will move around in your workbench. And this works with a diamond stone and with the wet stones as well. Just need to add some water here. This is the lubricant. Nothing more than water. And then what I'll do is put one finger on either side of the blade, set the blade down, and push. And what you'll see is a puddle forming at the end of the stone that gets darker and darker. And what that is, is the metal wearing down, and that's the sharpening working in action. So there you can see a nice keen edge. I'm happy with that edge, so I'm going to take this out now, and then I just need to lap the back. So it's just a matter of putting the blade down, and run it back a few times. And what that does is it takes the burr off the edge of the back. Some people, when they do this, they actually raise the blade very slightly, but I find this works. So just dry the blade off and then dry the stone off. For the sharpest blade possible I use a strop and a strop basically what you do is lay it on the bevel and then pull it backwards. This strop is green because it has compound on it and that's got a little bit of grit to it. What it's doing is polishing the blade. So after I go through and polish the blade here all I need to do is run it once on the back and that just takes the burr off so that starts to give me a really nice shine to the blade and then on the bare leather side same thing this is just even finer than what I was doing before that gives me a mirror finish across the micro bevel I can now reinstall the plain blade I back off the blade and I'll set it the first time I use it. I produce videos about once per month and I've had people asking for more frequent content. I can do that, but I can't do it without financial support. So I'm seeking a sponsorship and I'd like to partner with Lee Valley Tools on this. I've reached out to them several times and I haven't heard from them yet. And that's where you can help me. If you can email social at leevalley.com and tell them you'd like them to sponsor the YouTube channel, that would be helpful. It would also be helpful if you can include why that's important to you. I can get you more frequent content, but hopefully we can get some support to make that happen. I'll get this cleaned up here, let the glue dry overnight, we'll come back in the morning, and then work on the chest. The epoxy on these glue blocks have dried overnight, so I can now start planing them. But we had something really exciting happen last night here in Brooklyn, Ontario. We've had the largest snowfall of the year. And I know we've got viewers from around the world. Some of you have never seen snow in person. Let me give you a quick tour on the outside of my shop so you can see what this looks like. So here's what the street looks like. You can hear a couple snow blowers in the background, and people clearing the snow. I'll give you an idea of how deep it is. Here's a car driving down the street. You can see it here just how deep the snow is. And lots of snow in the car here. So we've got some cleanup to do. We've got some friendly neighbors that have snow blowers, so when the snow plow goes by, they'll clear out the end of the driveway. So it really makes for a lot less work, but still lots of shoveling to do. Here's the outside of my workshop. It's a single car garage. And if you'd like to learn how to heat and insulate a garage like this, I've got a video on that. I'll leave it in the video description.
time to go back inside and get warm. I hope you enjoyed seeing my Canadian snowy neighborhood. It normally isn't that snowy around here. We've had green grass for about half of the winter. Now I'm ready to get to these parts here. I'll get up my plane and set the blade. So I'll move the plane blade forward and it's not engaging yet. So what I'll do is just rotate it slightly until I start to engage with the wood. Okay, so there's a shaving. Just want to make sure that it's running square. Just adjust it slightly. On this other side, you can see it's sitting up much higher. So I need a, to plane a fair bit off. Okay, we're almost there. A few more passes, and it should be level. So what I'm looking to do is, see there's a bit of rocking happening here. Just need to get this part down. This is almost level here. There we go. I'll roll this onto some padding. And on the inside here, I've got this piece of wood that's gonna be covering this, so I don't have to be too particular. I can use a plane over here, because you can see my plane blade will cover this area. But over in here, it's way too tight, so I'm just gonna use a chisel to clean that out. This crank knife chisel is perfect for this. It allows me to get in this tight spot and work on a level surface and just pare away that waste. I'm going to stand this back up now. And we need to look at what I'm going to do here for hardware. And guess where I purchased the hardware? Lee Valley Tools. Part of the problem was that this wasn't put together with a hinge that would work properly and prevent it from coming apart. So I purchased a hinge that's meant for chest lids. If we look at the edge here, you see where the barrel is and this flange here. This is meant for three quarter inch material, but this is made out of one inch material, so it doesn't really work there. But if I put it over here where I patch this and slide it over here, it magically fits. So I think that's where this should go. Let me just line up the lid, make sure it's going to work there too. There are some screws that are broken off here. So it looks like the initial hinge was here. Maybe a second one was here. There's a bit of a patch. And then this one here, let's see how this lines up. Yep, I think that will work. So I've got a little bit of patching to do here. A little bit of patching to do here and then we can get that stain to match. On this side here there's a bit of patching to do as well but it looks like that's a good spot for the hinge. Now that I close that quarter inch gap up in the lid we've got a bit of an issue here so we've now got a quarter of an inch. Now I measured this and talked to the customer about it there's two options one is cut the trim off so you only have a quarter round instead of a half round or rabbit out a piece of the chest here so that the lid can come down. And because we've got a piece of trim going all the way around that's half round, it's going to look odd if it's a quarter round at the front. Lesser of two evils is to notch out the chest. So I've just turned this around, and what I'm doing is feeling with both hands that I've got enough overhang here. It's flush at the back, and that gets me lined up here that I can draw a pencil line so I know the rabbit that I need to cut in the front of this. So as I notch this out, you can see the hardware here is going to have to come out. And it's one of those trade-offs of closing up the gap in the lid creates another problem of having to set this back. So this is primarily a coffee table. That's where the focus is. And that's why the customers made this decision to take this out.
I now know how far back to set it, but I don't know how deep to set it. So what I'm going to do is clean off this edge on both sides here, glue it, and then use these original nails to put it back on, and then I'll know the depth that I need. I'm ready for the glue up here, and what I'm doing is I'm putting a hide glue on here, H-I-D-E, hide glue. It's an important glue when you're working on old pieces where you've got joints like this that might need to come off in the future. Hide glue is a reversible glue, which means I can put vinegar on it or you can heat it up and it will unglue. So I'll just put this across both sides of this joint and then I'll put the nails back in the original nail holes clamp it on and let this dry Now I can mark my line here. To make a rabbit so I can cut out this front corner here, I'd normally use a rotor, but there's a number of nails in here, and I think I've caught them all, but I'm not sure if I have. So I don't want to be running my machines here. I don't want to be using my good tools either. So what I'm doing is just replacing my blade here, on my Japanese saw, with an older blade. And this one, I've actually hit the odd nail or two. And these blades are pretty fragile. They can get damaged pretty quickly. So I don't want to be using my good saw blade on this job. So I'm going to be cutting straight through here, just taking off. It looks like about three quarters of an inch all the way along here. I'll just be careful around those nails. There's one there and one there. And then I should be able to fit the lid. This is too difficult to cut like this, so I just need to set it up in a way that I can cut it more easily. There, that's better. Okay, with that off, oops, I'll turn it right side up and we'll test the lid. So here's the lid. So it's going to sit something like that, but we've got this bare wood here and it's also a very straight edge compared to everything else. Everything else has been worn down with years of wear. So I need to wear this down and antique it make it look like it was original. First, I'll take the saw marks out. And then what I'll do is round it over. So I'll start with a bit of a chamfer here. And that'll just take off the front chunk of that edge. And then what I'll do is round it with sandpaper. There's a nail right there and there. I really gotta be careful not to get my blades anywhere near them. putting water on here to see what the color looks like next to this. So it is going to need some stain. It also looks way too new here. You see there's nail holes here and there's rust stains. I need to mimic some of that in here just to make this look more like it's older and not that this modification has been done recently. 
I'm just going to find some old rusty nails here. And what I'll do is drive those in and make some rust stains with them. So I'll drive these in just in random spots here. And then what I want to do is make them rust. So maybe there. And to do that, I'll get out some vinegar. By adding vinegar here, I'm going to break down some of that metal. I'll put it on the nail as well. And that should give us a rust stain. I'm also going to use my knife to cut a few marks along the grain to allow some of that to seep in and look like the other marks. As I'm working through the project, I just add a little bit of vinegar to make sure it stays moist to encourage that staining. I'm taking off the old hinges here to put on the new hinges. Now, some people might disagree with this, the fact I've taken a lock off, replaced the hinges, but this is a rustic piece that this customer wants to keep as a coffee table and wants it functional as a coffee table. So it's really up to the customer's decision as to what they want to do with it. What I'll do is keep these slotted screws, mount the hinges with the slotted screws, and we've got a little bit of history there. Now the key difference between these hinges is when this one gets to this far, it wants to rock. So if this lid ever flips back, it's pulling out. And that's probably what's caused some of the damage here. This hinge here will come back this far before it wants to pull. But it can't pull back because it has this flange here. So it's got that extra screw that's preventing it from damaging itself. So this is something that's going to last much longer. So I'll add this in here. And the best way to do this is with a self-centering bit. This is a drill bit that protrudes and there's an angle here. So what it does is it goes into the opening. You just push it down and you get a centered hole every single time. Big time saver. And it's really good for your accuracy. Now I'm just installing one screw in each hinge. What I want to do is figure out where the edge of this is so I can get the patching done. On this side of the hinge, I've got a little piece here I need to patch and out here as well. So I'm going to cut this off, cut it level, and then patch in that piece. Here I've got a piece missing, but there's an original part right there. But I do have a gap in between these. So I'll cut it off here as well and patch that whole section. I'm using PVA glue on this because I want a permanent bond. So I'll put the glue on, clamp it up. I want to make sure I've got lots of glue squeeze out. And then I want enough clamping pressure across the pieces so they bond properly. I can now set this aside. I'm almost ready to do the staining and the finishing, but first I need to attach these pieces of trim because I need to cut off the ends. Now, these were put on with nails, and in order to allow for the wood movement here, I don't want to be using these nails at the end. What I'm going to do is secure this at the front here, so that miter stays closed. And then back here, I'm going to be using a pin nailer, which is like a wire, and that pin will allow it to move slightly with the seasonal wood movement here, and won't force the top to crack again.
I'm gluing the miter and the first third of this trim. I don't want to be gluing all the way back here. So we'll just line up these old nails at the front here, put them in the same hole, and I'll help locate the trim. Now on either side of the end here, there's a slot where the old nail was. So what I'm going to do is just right in the center of it, drive a nail in, give it a little extra support. Now to put the hinge on here, you can see there's a couple spots that need to be patched here and here. And what I'm going to do is just take some of that material that I cut off the front, cut little pieces in here, and patch them up. I'm now ready to disguise the changes that I've made to this chest. Now, if I were just to wipe on a stain and a finish, it would stand out to the eye that there's something different here. So it needs some artistry. And I learned this skill when I was 24. I built a reproduction antique coffee table, and I'll show that to you. This coffee table sits in our living room. It does need an update in color, but it was built as a CD holder. The drawers pull out, hold a bunch of CDs, and at the back of the table, in front of the couch, I built in a flip out drawer to hold the TV remote. Now you can see on the top here, I've rounded the edges and smoothed them off at the end. I put some various dents and scratches. I've also put some marks, but the stain in this is actually three different stains. So by layering on different stains in different ways, you can make something look old and antique. Let me start by showing you what's happened with these nails. You can see the vinegar has done a great job on these to produce some stains around them. And you can see here, these were some of the older nail holes and stains. But if you look at the edge here, you see how it's rounded over? There's a little chunk missing here. It's a little bit rough here. A little bit different color there. And then look at the color tones. This isn't one consistent color. So there's a little bit more orange here. It's lighter here. There's a stain here for some reason. There's a little bit of color there, different here. So again, this just shows you if I put on one solid color, it isn't going to give me that vintage look that I've got here.
I'll start by taking out these old rusty nails. I like using fencing pliers for something like this. These are actually from my great grandfather. Great tool for restoration work. Now what I want to do is create a few marks on here. I'm just going to use a round file. I don't want a straight line here. So you can see there I've got a bit of a wear mark. So you can see a bit of the green there, so we're going to get some texture. And the important thing is it's breaking up this line here. So just really scuffing up the edge here. The key thing is you don't want any repetition of marks that you've made exactly the same. If you were, for example, I've seen people do this, take a hammer and hit it down here. Yeah, you're putting dents in it, but it looks like a hammer. So you're looking to really just reproduce some of the damage. And it's easy on a piece like this where you've got examples to work from rather than a reproduction where you're starting from scratch. Another technique is to take out a little piece of wood. So on the inside here, I've got some splinters that are missing from the edge. I'll just see if I can get one started here. cutting into the grain. So there you see there's a little bit of a split happening. Now rather than cut it, what I want to do is just twist it out. And what I'm doing is getting some wood grain exposed so it's not a cut surface. If I look over here as an example, you can see there's a piece missing here. It's just breaking up that surface. So I'm going to mimic that as well. So I'm just going to choose a spot here gouge out a piece of the wood, go this way, gouge it a little bit deeper, and there's a bit of a splinter coming out, which is perfect. That's what I like to see. So I've got some wear created here, I've got some good wear here, but this is far too straight of an edge here. So I'm just going to take a rough gouge out of it and see if I can get a splinter. There we go. And then another technique you can try to create some damage is just right near the edge, put your chisel and just give it a light tap. And there you've got some breakage. If you've seen some of my other videos, I prefer to use water-based stains, but when doing antiquing like this, I've learned to process using oil-based stains. So that's what I'm sticking with here. And I've got a variety of colors. I'm just going to work in different colors as I see needing them across the piece. So when I work with a piece like this, I just take a scrap, put some of the color on here, I think that's a good start, so we'll start with that as a base coat and then work up from there. So I've stained the patch here, but I realized I haven't aged this yet. So this is the piece that I cut off here. And you can see just how much wear is on that edge. It's really rounded. So the profile on a piece like this, it's um, gently rounded on the long grain and on the end grain, it's pretty blunt because that's where it's hard. So what I'll do is just take a file and I'm going to reproduce the same profile that was there. I've augmented this gouge here a little bit. I'll just put another one roughly here. And just try to flick that out and get some rough grain. Again, just looking to mimic a little bit of damage. So it looks old. You have to be very careful on end grain. End grain soaks up stain really quickly. And you can see it just on the edge there. So what I'm going to do is just seal up that end grain with some shellac. 
and that way when I put any further stain on top it's not going to soak in. This could look really really dark if I didn't do the sealing. Well the stain's drying I can look at these drawers. This one's operating freely. This one's okay until it gets to a certain point here and then it's binding. So oh looks like we've got a scar here. Oh there's a nail sticking out. So I'll take that nail out and see if that fixes the problem. Okay, I'll give this a try again. No, it's still binding. It's loose here, and then it gets tight. There are some rub marks here, and typically you plane the bottom of a drawer to fit it, but this has nails throughout, so I can't do that. There are also some rub marks here, which correspond to these nails. So I'll try and set these nails first, see if that works. Last resort is to play in the top here. I'm going to lose some of the patina here, but to get the drawer working properly, I might need to do that. Okay, let's give it a try. There we go. Could use some wax, but we're fine there. Now, you see these poles here? I've got one pole down here, but I'm missing one over here. So I'll need to make another one. And these are just made out of oak, so I'll carve that up. You can see it's not even cut square, so a very rustic knob there. Uh, sort of reminds me I need to put knobs on my drawers in my cabinet here. So this one, it's really stuck as well. So I wonder, we've got some rubbing happen happening here and here. Doesn't look like it's nails. There's some rubbing action here. I might have to plane this one to get it to fit. On the bottom here where I've got friction, I'm just going to set that nail. And then what I'll do is just put a slight rabbit in here to allow for the drawer runner. And that should free it up. Thank <laughs> you. 
When I mount this pole here, I need to make sure I've got a clean surface, so I've got a good glue bond. And on the new one, I'll need to clean off a space as well. I just need to sand the edges here, stain it to match, and then I can attach them. I'm putting on the second color here, and you can see the difference between here and here. And it might seem pretty light on camera up front here, but comparing it to what it used to be, it's a little bit darker. So this has got a little bit of that orangey tone in it. That's the base color. And this next tone is really darkening it down. It's got more of that brown color to it. So I'll spread this on. I'll let this coat dry and then come back for the third color. And we'll add some character to the wood. If you've learned a few new things here and you're enjoying this video, please give it a thumbs up. That tells YouTube this is a useful video and they'll share it with more people. With two different colors of stain back here, I can see the difference between the back and the front. The front here has some different stains in it, so it's more disguised. I'll give you a close up, you can take a look. So the back here, you can see there's some stains, but this is where the new wood is. And look at all the staining that's happening here. This is what I've been aiming for here, but I have to dirty up the back of this. Over here, it's less noticeable, um, but you can see there's a, a mark here that's a little bit darker. So I do need to blend that in a little bit. These marks here, the knot, the stain, this is disguising the fact that this is new. You can see there's a stain mark here and here as well. On this end, it does need a little bit of coloring just to make it blend in a little bit more with how this is appearing here. You can only layer on so much color with this type of stain. So my next step is to use shellac. It's doing two things. One is it's sealing the surface and the other is I'm going to be able to use powdered dye to be able to add some of those stain marks in here to make it look older. This is amber shellac, and I mix this up from shellac flakes. It's got just a little bit of color in it, not too much. I've got some raw umber dye here. So basically what I'm doing is putting on coat shellac here and shellac dries very quickly. So I'll put that on here. And then while this is still slightly damp, I'm going to introduce a little bit of color this way. Now this is where the artistry comes in. So I'm looking to blend that in. You can see how that is starting to look similar. So I'll just do that along here. And then once that shellac's dried, come back with another coat. Shellac dries very quickly. Okay, so I need a little bit more color. Okay, it's starting to blend in there. It's looking good. The hinge is going right there. A little bit more down here to go, just in this one spot. Touch it up. So it might seem odd that I'm using a shop towel to put this on, but it really is helpful just because I need to keep moving the cloth when I've got a little bit of dye on it. So I'm not spreading the dye all over the place. Okay, so a little bit of artistry here. Let's see. Put 
put a mark there, and a mark here, happy little spot. Okay, we'll let that dry for a few minutes, and then put shellac over top. We should be good to go. Come in with the second coat of shellac. Lock in that stain, it darkens it a little bit. And we're good to go. The shellac's dried, but you can see it's a little bit glossy here. The rest of the finish isn't. So when you take steel wool and you rub it on a glossy finish, what you end up doing is putting small scratches in it, and what it does is dulls that finish. So I can take this anywhere from a high gloss down to a really dull finish just by using 4 rot steel wool. That's super fine steel wool. ready to put the hardware on here. So I've already located it here on the bottom of the chest. I need to transfer those measurements to the lid. So I'll put the lid on here, turn it around. So we'll line this up in the center, I can feel a little bit of a gap underneath here. And then I want to make sure I've got an even gap up here as well, so that nothing's going to bind. Okay, now I can mark where the hinges go. Now on the pile of screws I have here, I don't know if I've got enough number sixes to do all these hinges. So there were four screws taken out here, and with these new hinges, I've got four, five, six, seven screws I need per hinge. So I might have to use some screws from my other collection. This is my set of supplies, and in here I've got lots of different size screws. That looks like the right size. So we use that to hold this hinge in place. And then I can test to make sure it's in the right location. Now I can attach these hinges here, and we're almost set to go. Part of me wondered with this tray here if this wasn't meant to be a toolbox. It's an interesting piece. It's pretty rustic. Definitely not a fine piece of furniture because of the way it was constructed with nails instead of dovetails. It'd be interesting to know the history of it. Now driving in slotted screws can be difficult sometimes, especially if they're worn. So what I find is if I use a modern screw and screw it in first, what that does is it opens up a passageway for those threads to grab. And that way I'm not doing that difficult work with a slotted screw. Just makes my life a little bit easier. Okay, so now I can put in this panel here to line up these holes. 
and get this on here and I'll have to notch it around the hinges. Actually, I don't think I need to notch it around that. Oh, and that means I can swap the screw out for that one and I'll have slotted screws. Okay, well that's working well. The last thing I have to do is put on a lid stay, and that's an arm that connects here, and that prevents the lid from flying back and potentially breaking off these pieces of wood and the hinges here. Because of so many hinges being replaced here, this is definitely something that's needed. I was able to buy a lid stay in bronze, so it matches the rest of this, but I was having a challenge with the screws. I don't have any vintage number five screws, so I was able to find some online, but you can see they're really new. So I tried a technique of soaking it in vinegar and then in salt water, and it did change it a little bit, but not really significantly. I found a technique that if you heat it up and you put it in coffee grounds, look at that, perfect. Okay, that's gonna work well. Now, there was a number of screws that were loose in here, but there's also an escutcheon plate, and it's a little bit warped, but that goes here. Let me see if I can flatten that out and put that back on. Suction plates are nailed on, and I found these old-fashioned nails here. So I've got enough space, and there's actually holes. So one on each side, I use those to tack this on. This rustic chest is now ready to go back to the customer. And if you were wondering how many nails I found in this chest, I pulled out 26 nails. About half of them were broken. If you'd like to get notified every time we publish a new video, click on subscribe and click on that bell icon. I'm going to leave you with another video right here that I know you'll enjoy. Thanks for watching Fixing Furniture.